Hi everyone, this is Jennifer and this is the second video of the transitivity system in the systemic functional linguistics. So in the last video, we talked about circumstance, which is the element that adds um, enrichment to a text by adding extra information about um, different types of time, place, and other things. In this video, we're going to talk about processes and participants. So like what I told you in the last video, processes and participants are inseparable in the sense that um, a certain process will have a certain participant which will be different from the participants in other processes type. Processes in transitivity are divided in, is divided into two big ones the processes of doing and the processes of being. Now, because this will take a long time to explain, I'm going to divide this video into this material into two again, processes of doing. And later on, we're going to discuss the processes of being in the next video. So the processes of doing, like its name, will uh, deal with processes of material mental, behavioral, and verbal. When we talk about doing, you will get a sense that we're going to discuss things that are physical. And yes, in some sense, you're right. We're going to mainly talk about things that are, that can be perceived physically or uh, by our conscious self. Now, the first type is the material process, which talks about physical activity and basically whatever you do with your limbs. So you can see it visually, of course, when you talk about material process and it has something to do with your um, hands and legs usually. So for example, my sister kills a rat. If you can see here, the process, the material process, is placed on the verb. And this is always the case. So process is something that we can always assign to a verb. Outside of a verb, it is usually not a, uh, a process. It is either a, a participant or a circumstance. So here, my sister is because she is the one who does the action, so she is called the actor. And the rat is the, the object or something that is um, being given an activity. So in here, a ra the rat is a goal. My sister kills a rat. My sister is the doer, actor. Kills is the process, material. And the rat is the done to, so it is a goal. Remember that not every clause has a goal in material process. Sometimes um, when we deal with intransitivity, um, intransitive verbs like read, sleep, and other types of verb that do not need object, we don't need a goal such as Jim read in his room. So again, reading is a material process because it involves physical your physical self. But uh, sometimes you don't really need to explain that Jim read a book. You just need to say Jim read where. So in this clause, we have the actor, Jim, and then we have the process, read, past tense, and the place in his room. Well, if you still remember the mood analysis from the previous, uh, from our previous weeks, you will remember that when a sentence or when a clause is changed into a passive clause, for example, my sister kills a rat, a rat is killed by my sister, by my sister in the mood analysis will become an adjunct. Meanwhile, in the in transitivity system, no matter how 
you change the active into passive, passive into active, when we talk about material process, your sister in this clause will still become the actor. So a rat is killed by my sister. A rat is still a goal because it is the one who that is killed. Uh, kills is still the process and by my sister is still the actor. So please don't mix it up with uh, mood analysis here. Material process has several types of participants. The first is the one that does the process. It doesn't always have to be a human. It can be an animal. It can be an inanimate object or whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, whatever that does the physical activity is the actor. And then we have a goal. The entity to which the process is directed to. So if I hit you, you are um, the one that gets directed to by the process. So you become a goal. A different type of participant is called the range, which is element that specify the domain of the process. We're going to discuss about goal and range, the differences, in the next slide. Okay, actor, goal, and range. And then we have a beneficiary or to whom or for whom the process is set to take place. Now, beneficiary is divided into two. Recipient, when we talk about goods or things. Client, if you provide a service. So, for example, I do your homework for you. So you receive a service for me, so you are my client. But if I give you some flower, you are receiving things for me, so you are a recipient. So that are the participants in a material process. Goal and range can sometimes be a little bit confusing, especially for uh, people who just learned about uh, systemic functional linguistics. But as we do more practice, as you do more practice, you will see that it is not as difficult to differentiate. Okay, I want you to try to study the two clauses. John shot the kangaroo. John shot a gun. One of these is has a, a goal and one of these has a range. Now, if you guess that the kangaroo is the goal and a gun is the range, then you are correct. When you shot, when John shot a kangaroo, the kangaroo is the target of the shooting, right? But when John shot a gun, the gun is not the target, but it is the object with what John shot. And because um, it is not a target, it is something that will help the shooting, it is considered a range. So range are usually empty verbs. Linda took a rest. You can say Linda rested. Finn did the shopping. Finn shopped. They ran the race. They raced. So all three clauses on the left are ranges. Sorry, half ranges. A rush, shopping, and um, the race are the range. Meanwhile, Linda took a cake. A cake is something that is um, that can that is a target of what Linda did. Finn did his homework. The homework is the target. They ran the diamonds. The diamonds are the target. So in this differences, we can see that when we use uh, empty verbs, they are usually ranges, not goals. So again, uh, a range are usually ranges are usually less independent than go. Alex did the transfusion. Alex did something else. So we can always change uh, the, the object or the noun after the word did. 
like with what we did uh, before. But when you say you transfused something, usually what you transfused is blood. You cannot transfuse money. It is not transfused. It is transferring. Or you cannot transfuse uh, knowledge. You're not transfusing uh, knowledge. You're imparting knowledge. So the noun that can be used with the verb transfuse is very small. So that is why you can say that um, the blood here is not a range, uh, sorry, it's not a goal, but a range. Okay, I know that there will be some confusion in uh, the discussion of goal and range, so we're going to discuss this further in our meeting this week. But yeah, moving on to the next one, mental process first. Mental process is um, the processes that deals with our five senses, our feeling, our thinking, and our perceiving. When we talk about feelings, we talk about hating somebody, liking somebody, wanting, uh, desiring. Those are deals. Those are the sensing that deals with feeling, and then we deals with. Things like I think your opinion, uh, opinion, thinking, understanding, you being confused. Those are the processes of mental that deals with thinking, and perceiving is what we do with our five senses like hearing, seeing, tasting, feeling. Uh, as in, you feel hot. That is not feeling like hate or love. So that is perceiving. So we have three types. Affective are the ones that deal with feeling, love, hate, wanting, etc. Cognitive deals with thinking, um, understanding, confusion. Perceptive is things that you perceive through your senses. There are only two participants. The sensor it okay the sensor is the one that feels something or thinks something or perceives something so it means it has to be a conscious being a conscious being can be an animal or a human or if you read us a magical or fairy tale stories sometimes we have animal who can talk or a plant who can uh, feel or sometimes even a chair who can talk. So, yeah, as long as in the context it is a conscious being, it can become a sensor. Phenomenon is what is sense, so the things that you sense. So, if you if you say, I, uh, I love you, love is the affective feeling, so the process. You is the phenomenon. Or the things that you sense. For example, here. Do you understand? You here is the sensor or the one that will perceive something. Meanwhile, understand is a cognitive feeling or a cognitive mental process. You understand something using your brain. And therefore, it is a mental cognition process. What about the word do here? So while the mood defied finite and predicator, finite being the auxiliary verb and predicator being the main verb, usually in the transitivity system, we don't differentiate it. So, do is usually left blank if it is separated from the main verb because the one that carries the process is the main verb. Do you understand? Now, I like sablak. Well, sablak is a type of Indonesian food because it talks about you liking something. It is a mental affection. Sablak is the thing that you like. So, sublock is the phenomenon, and because you act, because you like something, you are the sensor. 
And then we have love hurts. In here, even though love is the subject of the sentence, love is not a sensor because love is the thing that we, the conscious being, feels. So love, even though it is put in at the beginning of the sentence, it is still a phenomenon. Hurts is the verb, so it is the process. What about the sensor? Well, if the if the clause doesn't provide you with us with a sensor, then you don't have to create the sensor. The question baffles me. The question makes me confused. In here, you are the one who, who are confused. What confuses you? The question. So again, even though the question is put at the beginning of the sentence, it is still considered the phenomenon. And me, at, at the end, is the one who becomes confused because of the question, and you are the one who is feeling con confused, so you are the sensor. Again, perceptive or perception mental process deals with our five senses, hearing, seeing, uh, tasting. So we heard the explosion. We are the one who perceive things. The explosion is the thing that is perceived. So the explosion is the phenomenon and we are the sensor. Okay, I know that it can be quite confusing sometimes, but when we do the analysis on our own, when we practice more, I believe that this will become a lot easier. Now, sometimes the mental process can have what we call as the projection. Let's take a look at the sentence. I know that Jim is cooking pot roast. In this one sentence, we will find two clauses. I know and Jim is cooking pot roast. Now, if you notice here that uh, I know and Jim is cooking pot roast, I'm sorry, I press it too quickly, are two different clauses with two different type of processing. The first one I know is, of course, a mental process. And Jim is cooking because cooking is uh, something you do with your limbs. It is, and it is a physical activity. It belongs to material process. Well, this is what we call projection. So mental and verbal processes have the potential to project. When we have projection is that we have one clause that suggests something was thought or said and another clause that indicates that what was that that was thought or said. And when we analyze this type of uh, sentence, we need to still separate them, them into two. So each clause will have to be analyzed in their own right. So here, what we can do. I know that Jim is cooking pot roast. First, of course, we need to add a separation because I know is a mental process and the rest of the sentence is not. So I know here is I is the sensor and know is the mental process. And because that is only a con connective, we don't analyze that. And Jim is the actor because he is doing something. Cooking is, of course, the material process. And pot roast is the target of the cooking, so it is the goal. So when you have a clause, sorry, when you have a sentence that looks like this, you know that you have to set to separate the analysis and it will become two different clause. So yeah, basically this is projection and that is mental and material process. 
The next process we're talking about is the behavioral process. Behavioral process is a halfway between material and mental process, which means that we we feel something, but then we act on it physically. So it involves both both physiological and uh, psychological behavior. Let's take a look at this picture. This is a baby smiling. Smile is an action that we do physically with our body. But then usually a smile, especially when it is done by a baby, it is um, derived from a feeling. So it can be mental. So because it is something that is that comes from your insight, from your senses, from your uh, brain, but then you do it physically, it becomes behavioral process. Behavioral process is a combination of things that are material, phys uh, physical, and mental, psychological. So... Here, the participants that has to be there is the behavior or the one that does um, the behavioral process and the range. The range is the behavior that is enacted. So we are going to discuss more about this in, in the class. And of course, if you read my notes, there will be several examples there and of course, there are more explanation that goes with behavioral process. Now we're moving on to the last of the verbs of doing, which is the verbal process. Now, of course, I think you will have a, a notion of what a verbal process is. A verbal process is a process of saying or symbolically signaling. These are the things that we do with our mouth, usually, if you're a human, or if you signal something using a text or a notice or a warning board, those are seen as verbal processes as well. Yeah, verbal process, the same as mental, usually includes projection because usually when you say, oh, I tell you... I tell him that blah, blah, blah. So the blah, blah, blah is usually a different clause, which means projections, right? Uh, yeah, we're going to see the example later. There are a lot of participants here, but I think this will be uh, a little bit easier than the material process. The participants here are the sayer, or the one that does something, that, that the one that says something, remember, it doesn't always have to be a human. If you read uh, a warning sign, so if a warning sign, for example, say, speed limit 200 kilometers per hour, so that is the sayer, the notice board is the sayer. Uh, the receiver is the one whom verbalization is address. So if I speak to you, you are the receiver of my saying. So I am the sayer, you are the receiver. I told you a story. So I am the sayer, you are my receiver. The target is one acted upon verbally. So this is quite different from receiver. When I tell you a story, you only your job is only to listen. But the target of a saying is usually the one that, um, what can I say? Well, perhaps it is easier for me to give an example. I praised Ray for being diligent. So Ray here is not a receiver, but he is the target. But if I told Ray a story, Ray is only a receiver in this story. Okay, perhaps you can see the difference here. If not, then we are going to talk about this in our uh, meeting later. So participants say a receiver target and verbiage is the name for the verbalization. So 
I told you a story. I, the sayer, told the verbal process. You, the receiver, and the story is the verbiage. Okay, the verbiage is the name for the verbalization. I told you a joke. A joke is the verbiage. Um, I confessed a murder. A murder is the verbiage of what I confessed. Those are um, what I can uh, what I can tell you about the verbiage. So let's take a look at this example. Tom said, "I love you." We're not going to discuss the I love you part because that is the projected clause. We're going to talk about the projecting. So here we have Tom, the sayer, and said, the verbal process. Or we can also have things like this. She called Alex names. Remember, names here means insult or something that you do when you want to, yeah not insulting something, perhaps you want to make a joke out of something. She called Alex names. Alex is the target because she he is the one who being who is being called names. Names can be yeah, you egghead or something like that. Yeah. And then we have another target. William complimented his boss's wife. William is the one who say something, which is a compliment. And the target of the compliment is the wife. So remember, when you are only a receiver, you're not in the direct uh, end of the process, but you're merely a listener of a certain process. But if you're a target, you're in the direct end of the process itself. Now, that is the end of our discussion about um, the verbs of doing. And we're going to talk about the verbs of being in the next video, which will be uploaded, I think, next week, around next week, because this week we're going to focus on the uh, verbs of doing only. So yeah, thank you for now, and I'll see you next week.